Hi, and welcome to part one of this tutorial, which will demonstrate mastering techniques using the FabFilter Pro plugin bundle. Mastering itself is a widely misunderstood process. The main purpose of a mastering session is not to make your track as loud as possible, but rather to assemble the final product ready for distribution. In the case of a CD, this will mean arranging the songs in the proper order, taking care of song spacing and fades, then adding metadata such as ISRC codes and CD text before creating a disc image ready for replication. However, over the years, the role of the mastering engineer has grown to include final quality control for the project, and it is now expected that a mastering session will include some sweetening or corrections to the final mixes before assembling the CD playlist. Of course, if your mix is absolutely perfect to begin with, the mastering engineer will not touch it. As a mix engineer, you should be aiming to mix your tracks exactly as they should ultimately sound, in every respect other than final volume, and not to rely on the mastering stage to make them sound professional. However, in the real world, no one has perfect monitoring or perfect ears, so taking the mixes into a different studio to be worked on by a different engineer usually reveals areas which can be enhanced or improved slightly. And sometimes the cumulative effect of many such small improvements can be quite noticeable. I'm using an instrumental track as an example. This is a short piece created by my neighbour Martin Smith in the control room next door to my own and is intended for use as library music. I've started off with an instance of Pro-Q on the channel. I'll turn on the analyzer and set it to maximum resolution so we can see fine detail in the low bass regions. But I'll leave the EQ flat for now. I also have an instance of Pro-L on the master bus, which I've set to the K20 metering scale. But again, I'm not applying any actual processing yet except to turn the audio down a little to fit within the yellow zone of my K20 meter and to make sure I have plenty of headroom to work in. I'll now listen carefully to the track to try to identify any areas that I might be able to improve. In this case, I think there may be potential to tighten up the sub bass a little. And I think there may be some mid-range hotspots that are causing a slight sense of boxiness in the verse section. And a hint of shrillness and honkiness in the choruses. I also note that the musical structure relies on a tonal and dynamic contrast between the verse and chorus sections. So I need to make sure my processing preserves or enhances that contrast. Before I start actually processing the file, I'll first select the track and duplicate it, then rename the original track Bypass and mute it. This is just the way I like to work, and it simply means that no matter how complex and convoluted my processing gets, I can always compare it to the original by simply soloing the Bypass track. OK, so let's start by addressing the sub-bass issues. Our analyzer shows this activity right down below 20 Hz, which no conventional speaker system can reproduce. This is at a fairly low level already, but I'm going to clean it up a bit more with the high pass filter at 25 Hz. I'm also going to switch the stereo mode to mid side, click the cut symbol below the stereo placement buttons to split the band into separate filters for the mid and side channels, then select the side band and turn the frequency up to about 90 Hz. This removes all stereo information from the lowest couple of octaves of the mix, and is standard practice as most subwoofers are wired for mono anyway, my own included. However, it still sounds to me like there is a specific sub-bass frequency that is jumping out at me a little too much, especially during the first pre-chorus build-up. So I'll drag in a peaking band and go hunting for it. The traditional method is to sweep a boost around to identify the problem frequency but we can alternatively press and hold the band listen button to temporarily switch in a bandpass filter and listen to the target frequencies in isolation. And I quickly find the resonance in question at around 45 Hertz. A small cut of less than 2 dB is plenty for most of the song, but I've drawn in some automation to steepen this for the first pre-chorus. 
and even more for one specific note that booms out louder than the rest. OK, now I'm going to go on a hunt for the lower mid-range frequency that I think is causing the slight boxiness in the sound. Our analyzer is giving us a clue as to where this might lie, as there's a clearly visible peak at almost exactly 200 Hz. Let's listen to this frequency in isolation again. And we seem to have a prominent ringing from the snare drum. I'll narrow the cue with my mouse wheel and fine tune the frequency, which actually seems to be slightly below 200 Hz. Then dial in a sharp, narrow cut. Notice that because I dragged this EQ band into the white line on ProQ's graph, it has automatically been applied to just the mid band. I could switch this to stereo to affect both bands if I wanted. But in this case, the problem frequency seems to be coming from the snare drum in the middle of the stereo image. So it makes sense to correct just the mid channel. In a similar manner, let's drag in another band and hunt for the mid and upper mid problem frequencies that I heard in the chorus section. Once again, the analyzer is indicating a possible issue at around 1 kHz. And I think a slight cut here is appropriate. However, I'm also hearing a different problem, specifically with the melody part, which seems to be overly shrill at a higher frequency. Hunting around with a different band reveals this to be around 2.5 kHz. So I'm going to try a slightly narrower and deeper cut here. Once again, these cuts are just applied to the mid channel, indicated by the white line. But this time I'm not so sure that the problems are restricted to just the middle of the stereo field. Let's click the output level at the bottom right and try adjusting the pan ring around the outside of the knob. If I turn this all the way to the left, we hear the mono mid component, just as if I pressed the mono button in Reaper's master section. But if I turn it all the way to the right, we can listen to just the side components, which are the bits we lose when we listen in mono. And it's immediately obvious that those harsh upper mid frequencies are also present in the side channel. I'll therefore select both those bands and switch them to stereo mode so they affect both channels equally. This still leaves the side channel sounding rather thin and bright, however. So I'm going to try dragging in a boost for just the side channel. I'll make this quite broad and gentle with a Q of about 0.6 or 0.7 and try raising the low mid frequencies around 400 Hertz. Now I'll reset the mid side balance to zero so we're listening in stereo again. And I'll dial in an extreme boost for just the side EQ band so we can clearly hear the effect it has on the panned rhythm guitar part. That's a bit much of course, so let's pull this back to a more moderate setting of around 4 dB which is still quite a lot in mastering terms. I'm going to check these settings for the verse sections now. The cut at 1 kHz sounds OK to me, but I think the higher cut is making the snare sound dull in this section. So I'm going to use automation again to apply this cut only in the choruses. And I'm also going to automate the side boost for just the choruses which will help to exaggerate the difference in stereo width between verse and chorus sections, and hopefully help to increase the impact when the choruses come in. I'm becoming aware of an unintended side effect of our upper mid-range cut, however. The melody part is now a little quieter in the mix than the composer intended. I'm therefore going to try dragging in a shelving boost from the right, and see if I can replace the shrill upper mid region that I didn't like so much with some energy a little higher up. And it seems to me that this brings out a brilliance and shine in the part, a little like the violin sections of a symphony orchestra. Unfortunately, this boost also makes the cymbal crashes sound overly bright and distractingly loud. EQing a stereo mix in this way will often involve compromises of this kind. So you may have to balance an improvement in one area against an unwanted side effect in another. And this highlights the importance of getting your mix as good as possible before mastering. 
However, the mastering engineer has other tools available as well as EQ. So in part two, I'll be investigating dynamics processing. And we'll see if I can use frequency specific parallel compression techniques to arrive at a better compromise for the high frequency boost. That's all for part one of this tutorial. Thanks for watching.